Welcome to The Bird Who Made Me Happy. This is Alicia Bridge and I am your host. We're going to dive into the topic of what is it about bird songs that makes us so happy. You had a daughter and you bought a home. When I think about why I first became intrigued about bird songs, I can honestly say it might have been the stress of motherhood and the need to find some calm amongst everything. It could have also been my worry about the pandemic. Either way, I was on the search for answers for how to cope with the stress I was experiencing. And then one day on a drive, I heard a bird song. And it changed me. The times are a different now. My next guest is Avik Basu, an environmental psychologist at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. Avik is the co-author of Fostering Reasonableness, Supportive Environments for Bringing Out Our Best. And his research explores the questions of why is it that our attention fatigues after overuse and how natural environments, understanding the ancestry of our brain development, and listening to bird songs can replenish our resources for better productivity and happiness. Avik, thank you so much. I am just so grateful for learning about your knowledge, what you've gained around this subject, and for the time that you're taking to do this with me. So very appreciative. Glad to be here. I want to start out, I'm always curious about the roots of our motivation in life. One of the things I always wonder is, are there moments or are there experiences in our early childhood that have moved us or have given us motivation towards the work we're doing in the world now? My early childhood was characterized by an Indian immigrant upbringing. I grew up in southeastern Michigan in the suburbs of Detroit, being a son of Indian immigrants. Also traveled to India quite a bit. My parents both came from places that could be characterized as villages. Being in those places and seeing the contrast between that and the U.S. made an impression on me. Hmm. It struck me that we are capable of adapting to environments that we might perceive to be a lot less comfortable Hmm. or have the amenities that we're used to here in what was then called the developed world. So I had those images in my mind as as a young person and always felt we could do more with less. Mm -hmm. And less, to me, meant less urban, less technological, less of that kind of stuff. That said, I actually did my degree in engineering, worked on software and lots of tech stuff for a lot of my life. Until I switched over to psychology, I worked with the Kaplans who developed the attention restoration theory that you are curious about. Mm -hmm. It was in that transition that I was able to bring together that sense of frugality and economy, simplicity that I had sensed in my childhood to a more psychological understanding of how people are influenced by the environments that they engage with. Amazing. Before we kind of dive into Kaplan's theory, I'm curious, what was it about their work that led you into a deeper dive with them and into it? The attention restoration theory is only a small part of their work. It's probably the most popular, well-known part of their work, but their work goes much beyond that. And the part that spoke deeply to me was about understanding how the brain works in relation to the environments that the brain grows up in. So they look specifically at the way that the kinds of environments that you are in can influence the way you learn, influence your attitudes, influence your behaviors. Understanding that linkage was very captivating to me. That was really my first deep dive into understanding evolutionary psychology. Think about what kinds of universal behaviors do humans have that may have been adaptive in different kinds of environments. We now live in very different environments than our brains evolved in. So what are the consequences of having a 10,000-year-old brain in a modern society and trying to understand some of the challenges that are faced? Let's say things like information overload, being stressed all the time, thinking about why do we need these birds? You know, <laughs> Our ancestors that long ago didn't have nearly the amount of input to their systems that we now face. And for them, bird songs weren't a respite. They were more commonplace, so it's so Amazing. 
So I'm hoping that we're going to dive into Kaplan's attention restoration theory, and you can give us a bit of an overview. One of the most basic components of attention restoration theory is the idea that attention is a limited resource. Hmm. It can fatigue when it's overused. People who have drained their attentional resource might feel stressed. They might feel burned out. And this is where it's helpful to understand that there are different kinds of attention. And so attention restoration theory draws on the work of William James, psychologist in the early 1900s. Okay. He suggested that there were two types of attention. One kind of attention is directed attention. That is, you are intentionally paying attention to me. Or when you're reading a book, you're Mm -hmm. intentionally focusing in on something. Mm. You're directing your attention towards something with your effort. That effort leads to a fatigue of that directed attention capacity. Mm -hmm. There's another attentional system that James described using an example of being at a cocktail party. If you're talking to someone, you hear some noise that sort of sounds like your name and your attention is drawn to that. So that kind of attention is involuntary. In attention restoration theory, we call that fascination. Mm -hmm. Most of what we look at on our phones has sort of been designed to involuntarily get our attention. Like we we can't help it. A lot of people Mm -hmm. feel that way about getting on their phones and they can't quite get off and they call it an addiction. But the way those informational systems are designed take advantage of our involuntary attentional systems. We want to recharge our directed attention capacity, which we know fatigues. And the way to do it is to utilize the fascination system. Okay. So you can kind of think of it Easy. So when when the fascination system is engaged, the directed attention system can restore itself. Got it. Okay. When you think about that fascination, do you think about it like a distraction, that it takes that attention and it distracts you away from it? Would that be another way of describing it? It can. Think about it from an evolutionary perspective. It makes sense that we would be distracted by something like our name being called, Mm -hmm. or if there was a growl in the corner, right? You'd probably want to pay attention to that and not have to consciously attend to that, but rather have your system sort of respond automatically to something like that. Don't want to delay the growl response. Exactly. (laughs) And yes, it can be distractions. And certainly these days, like the stuff we see on our phones and whatnot can be a distraction. To explain that, it's kind of useful to think about two different kinds of fascination. Okay. And the two types of fascination Kaplan's describe as hard fascination and soft fascination. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at, let's say, a social media feed, the ones that are liked most Mm -hmm. are the ones that are capturing people's attention easily. They just grab you. So that is a pretty good example of hard fascination. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's hard fascination is because it's mind filling. Mm. It takes up everything. Or you can think of a Netflix binge Mm -hmm. as hard fascination, meaning there's no space left in your head to consider anything else. Even a rational decision, like I should stop. That's right. I mean, you're not thinking about that. And you have very little control, very little capacity Mm -hmm. to use your willpower. The very willpower you need is, in fact, your directed attention resource. Right. You need to pay attention to that signal that maybe I want to stop. But because you don't have that, you continue watching. So it has this Mm. devolving, vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, knowing it doesn't help. I binge on Netflix as much as anyone. (laughs) I'm saying that in jest a little bit. The other kind of fascination is called soft fascination. A good example is nature. Mm -hmm. Nature is kind of the sweet spot for restoring your directed attention. Because unlike watching Netflix or your social media feeds, in nature, what's happening is that you're lightly attending to Mm. things like bird songs, to things Mm -hmm. like wind rustling through the leaves. Or this morning I was out for a swim and I, I saw some birds going through the sky. But those stimuli, whether visual or auditory or otherwise, are not completely filling the mind. Mm -hmm. And because it's not completely filling the mind, the mind can then go into what I like to call garbage collection mode. Okay. So you have very likely lots and lots of things on your mind. Thank you for noticing. Stresses, like we all do, right? (laughs) And they're unresolved threads. And the more unresolved threads that you have, it's sort of like having lots of tabs open. 
Mm -hmm. more tabs you have open, the more divided your attention becomes. And it gets hard to use your directed attention capacity. Again, this negative, vicious cycle that can occur. What we want to do is have those tabs closed off. And a lot of this is not happening consciously necessarily. Right? Mm. A lot of it is, is just part of our system. We hypothesize that garbage collection happens or that tab closing happens. When you're in situations that allow for soft fascination, those tabs will close themselves out. It's making me think a little bit about playing light background music or, you know, even with my kid, I kind of put on bird songs. But I wonder, do you have understanding of what soundscapes are beneficial to instill that soft fascination? I played around just as, as a layperson looking at brainwave kinds of music, looking at bilateral stimulation music, ambient music. There are lots of ways in which soundscapes can potentially impact us. But I think an important distinction to make is that those things are manufactured. Mm. And bird sounds, natural sounds, wind, you know, water on the shore, all that kind of stuff, we probably have an evolutionary link to natural sounds much more so than we have to a manufactured sound that supposedly can hack our brains to make us function better. Right. Now, I'm not saying that's not possible, but one interesting difference is the time course of these things. If you listen to a soundscape kind of thing, usually it goes on for minutes or hours even, right? Mm -hmm. And probably our brains acclimate to those kinds of things and the effects are lessened with time. Mm. Whereas bird songs have kind of a ephemeral quality. They are very different. They're random sometimes. I mean, mm. th there's a much more organic quality to natural soundscapes than to manufactured sounds. Now, there are uh, recordings of bird sounds that are quite interesting, I think, that could have a mm. positive effect. And I think some of the papers out there do look at the effect of that. And I also think that virtual reality is an interesting space to explore. I also have to say that there's probably something about being in the space complete. Mm -hmm. You're outside, you're hearing the birds, you're seeing the trees, you're engaged in that space. And I suspect that there's a whole lot more going on than we can scientifically, reductively yeah. provide an answer for. So if I had to put my money out, just say, go outside. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably a good idea. Probably yeah. more happening there than we know. Yeah, I'm so curious how learning about these things has changed your behavior. I'm glad to hear that you still binge on Netflix every once in a while. But I wonder what you have observed for yourself about being able to kind of capitalize on this knowledge of getting into those soft fascination stages. I think one thing I've learned is that what you like isn't necessarily good for you. Mm. We know that from many circumstances around, let's say, food or diet and things like that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to addressing our stress levels and kind of dealing with our psychology, I hadn't really considered that as much. So mm. when you're stressed or mentally fatigued, you may not want to go outside for a walk because it takes that extra little effort to do it. And often people talk about, it's like, oh, yeah, the moment I put my foot out the door, I felt great. Totally. But getting that foot out the door is the, the hard part. But once you start seeing some benefits to that, and that's what the science helps you do. It, you may not feel better immediately in some cases. Sometimes it takes a day or two, or you realize you went on a camping trip, and then the following week, you're all productive. And so making the link between the activity you did outside mm. and the good feelings maybe you had some time afterwards. Science helps you, this theory in particular, helps you make the attribution. Yeah. One of the individuals I spoke with, Terrence Miranda, he's an audiologist here, and he describes what it's like to get hearing aids and to regain the ability to hear different soundscapes. One of the pieces that I found fascinating is that that's a learning process. Hearing is not necessarily what can you hear, but what are you paying attention to? in that when we are going outdoors, I wonder if part of it is that we're starting to pick up slowly on those soft fascination things and being like, oh, that's that's interesting. And then we look for more and then it kind of builds up that language or that skill set in being able to become aware of those soft fascination aspects. Yeah, my colleague Jason Duvall has done some work looking at people who mindfully pay attention to aspects mm. of nature and has found that that can be helpful mm. in the restorative function of nature. So I think what you're saying is true. That can be learned. That said, there are benefits without 
any sort of conscious attending mm. required that it can simply be that because you are in an environment that has certain features that evoke soft fascination that it can lead objectively to a restoration of attention attention mm -hmm. capacity and are you aware of any particular bird soundscapes that come to the forefront as being the most restorative i'm not an expert in the role of bird sounds but i can describe a few characteristics of environments that might be restorative mm -hmm. so i've mentioned soft fascination already basically that you're fascinated by bird sounds but it leaves enough room in your head to do the garbage collection mm -hmm. and that can be through reflection through pondering there's also the notion of being away hmm. It is helpful to feel like you're not just in the same kind of environment day in and day out. And even listening to a bird song makes you feel like it's in a different time or a different place. Mm -hmm. There's also a notion of extent. Okay. That is, how mind filling is it? So it's kind of linked to the soft fascination bit. But if it's not interesting at all, it's not fascinating at all, it probably isn't going to have that nexus of feeling like you're in, in a different kind of environment in a way that's engaging to the mind. Mm -hmm. The last one I'd say is about compatibility. Okay. The question is, what kinds of environments are compatible with our needs? Hmm. So we're kind of saying that nature is always good, but let's say that you have some traumatic experiences being in nature. Mm -hmm. Then perhaps that environment is not compatible for you, too, because if you're stressed or negatively aroused, then it's not going to be a restorative experience. Mm -hmm. I was just imagining, like, what if a pterodactyl came down from the sky and just screeched? That probably wouldn't be a very restorative experience. It's amazing because there's these blue herons. Have you ever heard a heron? I Paul? just saw a heron. This morning. So there's a heron rookery really close to where I live. It's almost a terrifying sound when you go up there because it sounds what I think pterodactyls would sound like. This <laughs> screeching, cawing sound. I know herons are not going to pick up my kid but you're right there are certain sounds that alert us in a different way that are sparking that that's right so I want to talk a little bit because I think it's so curious what you describe as garbage collection we often refer to a psychologist also from the early 1900s I want to say named Zagarnik he study a lot of this stuff hmm. about why do people remember things what stays in their head these unresolved threads what provokes that to stay in your head versus what allows them to get resolved, to get closed out. So she did a bunch of studies and found what's known as the Zagarnik effect. Okay. The gist of it being that when you work on something and you stop before you're finished, you're more likely to process that thing and be able to work on it the next day. But if you finish it, that's the resolution of it. Then you're less likely to remember it and keep working on it. From a productivity standpoint, let's say you're a writer or you're doing something like that, it may make sense to stop before you're done so that you can pick up the thread the next day. Mm. But when we think about all of the unresolved threads that get laid down in our minds through all the things that we do on a daily basis, mm -hmm. it probably doesn't pay to have a lot of that stuff hanging around up there. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about garbage collection, I mean, how many things have you closed out? And some of that stuff happens subconsciously. The closing out of those things doesn't require necessarily that you have to surface everything into consciousness and mm. kind of figure out the answer and then put it away. It's a much more behind the scenes process, but we can facilitate that process by being in environments like nature. Mm -hmm. So that's understanding we have about attention restoration theory and why it works. Yeah. And it's so nice to know that there's a process that happens, that it allows for that. One of the pieces that I'm always curious about is this reflection component. So is there another element in which we then actively participate or perhaps we end up having insights or we end up having awarenesses of an answer or resolve that just kind of comes in that space? And can you speak to that? Is that also what's happening in that stage? What you're describing sort of a process of problem solving. Mm -hmm. so your brain is tinkering with some problem. It's not resolved because it hasn't been solved yet. Just like the story of people coming up with solutions to their problems in the shower. Mm -hmm. Explicably, not because you were thinking about it. Many great thinkers have been known to go for long walks on a regular basis. And that 
provides some catalyst for their creative problem solving. Like Darwin used to go on walks regularly. All of that suggests that there is some sort of subconscious problem solving going on all the time. Right. You can think about it this way, that there's sort of a space of problem. And interestingly, any solution you have to a problem is also something you know, right? Mm. <laughs> would have to be. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no way for it to be in your head. So mm-hmm. you can develop that accord. So you've got a problem and you've got a solution. And our theory is that when neurons in the problem space connect to neurons in the solution space, mm. that's that moment of Eureka. Hmm. Again, all that's happening subconsciously. So what can you do to allow space for those things to get connected? Being in nature is helpful because it doesn't add additional noise to that process. So imagine right. like these things are trying to come together, but then you've got a thousand other things that are sort of preventing that problem solution coming together. Yeah, it makes me think a little bit about meditation and mindfulness and the sort of concepts of lightly attending being able to get into that observer sort of standpoint in which you're witnessing what's happening, what thoughts are coming up, but you're not necessarily navigating every thought that comes and following it down the chain. You're just allowing these things to kind of bubble up and be like, oh, there's that. Oh, there's that. And for me, at least when I need to have those ahas to a decision is that I I go into those space. And importantly, in meditation, you're not introducing new information into the system. Mm-hmm. from the external world at least. totally that is one of the big differences in modern society that we have so much external input mm-hmm. that it can be difficult to wade through it all and find clarity with respect to the problems that we're we're trying to solve you were asking about reflection there is of course a conscious reflection process that can be helpful as well mm. And that, too, is aided by an environment that doesn't have input that is of the hard fascination quality. Right. So if you're watching Netflix, you're probably not reflecting Mm -hmm. in a very useful way or in a sustained kind of way. Mm -hmm. There's not those breaks or those moments in time in which there is space. Exactly. Whereas I experience that in nature, that there sort of just is this pause going on and I get to overlay what's, what's coming up. That's right. You can hear the bird calls for a moment, but then your mind has some reflective quality and then it goes back out to the birds and then comes back and there's this sort of in and out effect. And it's soft. It's not jarring. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you've sort of spoken to this kind of neuroscience or a little bit about one of the aspects that's happening. And I wonder, is there anything else there that you think is relevant or important or that has struck you in terms of what's going on you know, neurologically in our experience? Another piece that's useful to consider is the role of what's known as the default mode network in the brain. Okay. A network, it's a set of brain regions that turns on when nothing's happening. It's sort of like your car is idling. Okay, yeah. We hypothesize that that activity in the default mode network is what allows the garbage collection to happen. When you think about it from the standpoint of what kinds of environments we live in now compared Mm. to the environments that our ancestors had 10,000 years ago, the opportunities for the default mode network to be active, Mm. to be idling, were much more prevalent 10,000 years ago than they are today, because we are in a state of always on. Yeah. And so that attentional fatigue, stress, again, irritability, all of these things that we are seeing might be linked to that very fundamental issue of our brains weren't really designed to have this much on time right. without some off time, yeah, without a significant amount of time for the default mode network to do its garbage collection. Mm-hmm. You've named the reflection and those kind of things, but are there other qualities that we get to experience when we access this default mode network? Well, I think there's some interesting stuff about being in nature and feeling awe. Mm. We don't talk about that as much in attention restoration theory because we're, we actually believe that you can have restorative experiences in awe-inspiring places, but also just by looking at, you know, plants growing out of cracks in the sidewalk, you know? <laughs> so I think that's pretty awe-inspiring when you see that. You're like, dang, you did it. Yeah. How'd you get through? <laughs> right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> when we are mired in our own stories mm. all the time, that can have a 
stress inducing effect. Mm -hmm. We're kind of trapped in our stories and our stresses, our to do's. And what nature sometimes allows us to do is to step outside that, that for a second, you're not your worries. Mm -hmm. You are part of something much bigger. You kind of have a sense of something much more mysterious than we can ever really know. It's really fascinating and hopeful to hear what one perhaps gets to experience when they let go some of attending to all of those things. That's right. I'm so grateful for your curiosity around these subjects. There is something very comforting for me when someone is taking these questions and looking at them deeper and starting to give us some aha moment of why these things feel beneficial. Thank you. It's, it's been really lovely talking you with you.